Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, in this uh, lecture, I will um, try to explain what uh, Neon Li ADS2 gravity is. So, this is a, a particular two dimensional theory of gravity. Um, I'll try to explain how it is connected to four or higher dimensions. Uh, that will be one of the points. And another point will be to uh, try to connect it and try to find out uh, which features it has in common with the SYK model we were talking about before. Okay. Now, before I get directly into this, um, I'd like to mention, well, one general point. So, suppose you have a black hole and that is embedded in some space, right? This black hole is supposed to be described by a quantum mechanical system with a finite number of degrees of freedom given by the entropy. Um, but this black hole is, of course, coupled to the, uh, to the flat space around it or ADS space or whatever space it's, it, it is sitting in, right? So it's not an isolated quantum system. It's a quantum system that is coupled to, uh, to its environment in some way. So if we have... Uh, let's say all the black hole microstates, and uh, this is emitting radiation, so there will be some operator um, that couples the black hole microstates to the radiation. Um, and furthermore, uh, this radiation could be emitted and then falling back into the black hole, so it will lead to um, diagrams of this form, so we have somehow the black hole microstates and the radiation, and this leads to corrections, which are um, which are in some sense important, in some sense they are not important. So um, uh, they're important in the sense that if they will affect what the particular energy levels of this black hole are. Of course, the energy levels are exponentially, uh, they're spaced by an exponentially small amount in, in n. So by e to the minus n, it's the energy splitting because there is a further e to the minus s, whereas it's the black hole entropy, there are further e to the s states that you have to fit, that's why. Um, and so there will be large corrections to the energy levels. Uh, there might be small corrections to other observables due to this. But if one wanted to address uh, questions of unitarity and so on, it's sometimes convenient to isolate the black hole degrees of freedom uh, from the rest. And um, in, in general, yeah, one uh, strategy to do this is to um, take uh, take flat space, and uh, and in some cases you can the black hole develops a long throat of an ADS, uh, an anti-de-sitter geometry, and where there is a large redshift factor between the region near the horizon and the region far away. And in these cases, if you take a suitable limit, you uh, could uh, isolate the degrees of freedom of the black hole. So that works nicely uh, if this region is a higher dimensional, AD an ADS-D with dimensions bigger than two. Um, and then what you isolate is not purely the black hole, but the black hole together with this whole ADS region. Okay. Now, imagine that uh, we are uh, considering uh, a black hole in four dimensions, uh, just to be concrete. Let's say we have a four-dimensional black hole. Um, then um, a black hole that develops this ADS region uh, could be a charged black hole. So if you have a charged or rotating black hole, uh, charged. Um, then uh, the mass uh, is, in general, bigger or equal than the charge. Uh, that's in order to have a regular horizon with no singularity. And when the mass uh, becomes similar to the charge, uh, the black hole develops this long uh, region, which in this case will have the geometry of an ADS2 times S2 space. Um, you can do the same in higher dimensions, and there the geometry would be ADS2 times SD minus 2. Okay, so, um, but if you started with a localized black hole, then uh, you will have this ADS2 region in this special limit when uh, the mass is uh, very similar to the charge. And in this limit, the Hawking temperature is also going to, the, to zero, or the inverse temperature going to infinity. So now, um, this ADS2 region contains uh, more symmetries than uh, the, the full solution. The full solution is invariant on there only under an overall time translation. Um, but the ADS2 region has also a kind of translation symmetry along the radial direction. It has a kind of rescaling symmetry along the radial direction. Um, 
So we can write the metric, for example, as uh, in the completely extreme limit where the temperature goes all the way to zero. We can write the metric. Uh, um, well, let me write it. So this is the metric in this uh, near horizon region. And it has a rescaling symmetry where t goes to lambda t and r goes to r over lambda. This is an isometry of the metric. It's just a coordinate transformation. The metric uh, remains the same, uh, exactly the same. Um, sometimes uh, also for what we will do later, it's convenient to choose another variable, which is c1 over r, and write this as minus dt squared plus uh, dc squared over c squared. Um, and so here, r going to infinity corresponds to the region here uh, near the top of the throat. r goes to zero here at the very bottom of the throat. And uh, for c is, of course, the opposite. c equal to zero is the boundary. And uh, OK. Now, so the system develops more symmetries. So it's a bit like a conformal uh, fixed point or a critical point. Um, and uh, we, we could wonder whether there could be a system, quantum mechanical system, that has uh, also this exact symmetry. Um, now, well, I mentioned, yeah, before I get into that, I'll mention one more point, um, which is uh, that uh, in, as we approach extremality, the entropy of the black hole is uh, the extremal entropy which is given by the area of this two sphere divided by G Newton, uh, plus uh, near extremal entropy, which um, goes like some constant uh, times the temperature, okay? Um, this uh, correction comes uh, when uh, the horizon is not all the way at, at infinity in the bottom of the throat, but it's at some finite location, then the Radius, the radius of the sphere is not exactly the value you would have in the extremal limit. That would be the S naught. It would be slightly different, slightly bigger. Um, and it, uh, it has a correction of this form. So this is for general black holes. The, um, this constant, of course, uh, depends on G Newton and the total uh, electric charge of the black hole or, or angular momentum of the black hole if it was a rotating black hole. And uh, roughly speaking, the uh, the ratio of redshift factors between the top of the throat and the bottom of the throat is uh, proportional to uh, the inverse temperature, proportional to beta. Okay? So the, the bigger beta is, the bigger this ratio of redshift factors is. Um, okay, good. So can we have uh, this structure in a, in a, can we have exactly scale invariant system in, a, in quantum mechanics? And, um, we want a quantum mechanics that has the following properties. So it has a finite entropy, finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, S0 or S, total S should be finite. Um, and then we can ask what could the density of states of this quantum mechanics be? Um, so we have a bunch of um, energy levels. Um, we could imagine having a discrete set of levels, but a discrete set of levels would be incompatible with uh, scaling symmetry of this kind. Um, so the only possibilities are to say that you have a one over E. Um, so then D over E is scale invariant or a delta function of E. Um, now, both of these are unsatisfactory to describe the near uh, horizon dynamics of this. This one is unsatisfactory because it contains only zero energy states. And if all the energies are exactly degenerate, you would have no dynamics. Um, and this is unsatisfactory because uh, the total number of states, which is the integral d over e, uh, um, the integral d over e would be infinite. Okay? And the infinity comes from small energies. Um, I mean, the infinity that is problematic is for small energies, which is where the scaling symmetry should be more accurate. Okay? So we cannot have something, some quantum mechanical system where the symmetry is exact. And so uh, similarly, we don't expect that uh, fewer, well, okay, so uh, gravity in purely ADS2 space uh, cannot be dual to a quantum system with a finite number of degrees of freedom, okay? Um, you, you might wonder whether 
gravity uh, makes sense just uh, on, on its own in purely ADS2 space, and we'll see that it doesn't. So what makes sense is to take a limit where we are close to ADS2, but not exactly in ADS2. So the kind of gravity theory that does make sense uh, is uh, what we will call nearly ADS2 gravity. Well, I, we called it uh, like that over there. So it's a, it's a situation where you, you are close to ADS2, but it's not exactly ADS2. So we have to keep the leading deformation away from ADS2. And that, that gravity theory makes sense and will be the subject of what we are going to discuss. Um, before we, we discuss that, that, that thing, let's, me, let's uh, just look at this metric again and notice that uh, it has certain uh, so-called asymptotic symmetries. So let me try to define what is an asymptotic symmetry. Um, now, this, this metric has some isometry. So an isometry is a proper uh, symmetry of this metric, which is the, a change of coordinates that leaves the metric invariant, okay? So that's, uh, this in particular is an example of an isometry of this metric. There are other isometries, is t going to t plus a constant, and then there is a third isometry. So there are three isometries, proper isometries of this metric that form the symmetry group uh, SL2 or SL2R, okay? So this is the group of isometries of this metric is SL2. Now, imagine we attempted to do a change of variables which where t goes to some f of t, okay? And um, so then, uh, and then c goes to f prime of uh, t times c, okay? So we change uh, the time in this way and also change the coordinate in this way. Um, so if we do that, then uh, when we look at this first term in the metric, we'll get an F prime uh, from the first change, and then uh, due to the second uh, term there, uh, that will cancel, and here we will, um, this factor, this first factor in the metric would remain the same, okay? Uh, when we get to the second factor, uh, there will be a term where we take the derivative of C, where again the F primes will cancel, um, but then there will be another term where we get some derivatives here on f, we get some f double prime and a c in the numerator, and that term doesn't cancel. Um, but it's proportional to z, right? So if we are at z very close to zero, which is the boundary of the space, then that term is subleading. Okay. So the conclusion is that this is a, a symmetry uh, if we are in the z very close to zero region. So the idea is that uh, if we have, let's say, set, and then here we have time, so there is this region of, uh, this is C, well, maybe I should go it the other way. Uh, this is C equal to zero, that was the boundary, and then this is the interior. Uh, when we do this transformation, uh, we leave this region uh, the same, but we are changing the form of the metric in this region. And that is just a coordinate transformation. So it gives us uh, some other metric which will have a different form in this region. So something that does this is called an asymptotic, met asymptotic symmetry. So it leaves the asymptotic form of the metric fixed. Asymptotic means this far away form of the metric fixed, uh, but it changes the metric in the interior. Okay. Um, okay. Now, we can, uh, let's imagine we are in Euclidean space so we can consider the Euclidean black hole. So um, the Euclidean version, so this is ADS2. The Euclidean version of ADS2 would have a plus sign here. Uh, that's a hyperbolic space. You can view that as, a, uh, an, as a, the upper half plane, or equivalently, you can think of that uh, as the, the Poincare disk, so this just a full disk. If you want Everybody familiar with the relationship between the two, or should I explain a little more? So, if uh, the, the surfaces of constant set in these coordinates uh, look a bit like this. So, this is uh, t equal to infinity in those coordinates, and 
then as you increase, as you make sets smaller and smaller, you get surfaces that roughly look like this. Okay. Anyway, so we can um, we can consider uh, this uh, the hyperbolic disk, um, and then uh, we uh, could imagine uh, setting some boundary conditions where we go. Uh, where we take a metric like that and put, put some cutoff, let's say at c equal to epsilon, uh, some small epsilon like this, and we, we have this circle. Now we could uh, apply one of these asymptotic symmetries that would uh, leave this invariant, um, and that would change the metric here in the interior. Um, alternatively, uh, so we could do that and then keep the cutoff at the same position. Um, or another thing we could do is to um, equivalent is just go back to the original coordinate, but then uh, this coordinate, this, then we would have to change the position of the cutoff to a new, um, to, to a new position that, uh, whose position depends on, um, on this uh, change of coordinate that we have done, okay? Yes. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, yeah, you can look, you can try to classify all the asymptotic symmetries so they are all given by this function. But why I'm not allowed to write down any polynomials of these? Yeah, so. so we go to they will, uh, yeah, they would vanish as they would be equivalent to this. So the idea is that uh, th th they would uh, have the same action uh, near infinity as this one. So if you put higher order terms in C, right? Uh, for small c, they would reduce to this one. Uh, well, the, 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 um, <coughs> I mean, the, the, the form of the asymptotic symmetries is not unique. So you can here change by all these polynomials you're talking about, but we'll consider them as equivalent. So if they differ by higher order terms in C, we'll uh, consider them as equivalent. Um, so, um, okay, so the, um, so we have, we, we, when, when we consider uh, the, the boundary, some physical boundary here of this ADS2 uh, region, um, we'll have a family of possible boundaries uh, that is somehow parameterized by these functions f, uh, f. Um, and we can think of, uh, but well, we can parameterize this in this boundary in different ways. So we can uh, give what the radial position is, and um, that uh, will give us uh, this uh, what this prime is. But um, if we fix the proper length, so usually when we treat these problems, we want to fix the proper length of the boundary curve. Okay. So um, then. Um, you can parameterize all these boundary curves by giving the a function of the of the proper length of the boundary curve, and of, of, of yeah the or equivalently we can give the tau of u, where tau is the so in this uh, circular coordinates we have tau uh, and rho, and so you can give tau of u, which is the angular position as a function of uh, this angle which has period to pi as a function of the proper length uh, along the boundary. So u is uh, the proper length. And when we do those asymptotic symmetries, we change from one function to the other. So this whole space parameterized by uh, all these asymptotic symmetries is equivalent to the given functions of, uh, of u. Okay, and then the, the raw position is given by the derivative of this function. Okay. Um, so we have this whole family, which are related by uh, this uh, symmetry. The geometries are not all the same. I mean, they are different. So we could have uh, a geometry which is a perfect circle, or it, so this is the full Poincare disk. So we could have a perfect circle, so that's one geometry. Or another possibility would be to deform this circle uh, and have, let's say, this other geometry. Um, and 
these two geometries, local linear, the boundary are the same. That's the statement of asymptotic symmetry. So if you are very close to this curve, you see exactly the same. But if you have access to, let's say, measuring the distances between these two points, you'll find uh, differences. Okay. So this um, this um, function is really parameterizing uh, different geometries. Okay. Um, and if uh, you, um, so this this should uh, ring some bells. So the um, so in the case of uh, ADS, in the case of SYK, that we found these reparametrizations, right? That were parameterizing different physical configurations, and they all had the same action. So let's uh, see about uh, what is the action in this case. So here uh, we, let's uh, first start with the such naive ADS2 gravity. So the action would be just two dimensional, the two dimensional Einstein action. Uh, so let's say some constant here, we're going to call phi naught, uh, square root of GR, right? Um, so we have uh, an action of this kind in two dimensions. Uh, this is just a topological invariant. So here there is a two uh, integral of the extrinsic curvature. So if we have a boundary, this whole thing, so when we have a boundary as in those cases, we have to add this term in order, for the, uh, for, in order that the action leads to the right equations of motion. It's called the given socking term. It's always present when we have uh, gravity with a boundary. Um, and um, the, this action is a topological invariant, so uh, it gives just a constant for all those curves, okay? So any geometry we have over there, uh, we have uh, exactly the same action. And so the, uh, the action is just proportional to this phi naught, and the interpretation uh, in those cases of this action is just that it is given as the uh, uh, extremal entropy, okay? So the coefficient here phi naught, if we come from four dimensions, will be given by uh, the area of the S2 uh, divided by G Newton. That's uh, the higher dimensional origin of this uh, phi naught. So this is uh, area over G Newton, okay? Up to some numbers of, of factors of phi and so on that I'm not writing. Um, okay, so we have the same structure that we had in the SYK model, that we had a, a family of solutions, uh, um, all with the same action to, to lead in the, the first approximation. Um, and uh, this problem is ill-defined for the same reason that it was defined in the SYK model. So we would have to integrate over all these functions and would give us an infinity. So that's related for, to why this purely ADS2 gravity does not make sense. Um, so uh, we, we need to uh, understand what the leading correction uh, to this action could be. Um, and um, so this, what we discussed so far is exactly ADS2 gravity, okay? And now we'll get to nearly ADS2 gravity. Um, so nearly ADS2 gravity will correspond to keeping one of the degrees of freedom uh, here of the size of the S2. So we're going to think of the size of the S2 as the extremal area. So here we said that uh, phi naught was the extremal area. Um, but then we consider some small deviations away from the extremal area. So we're going to write, uh, we're going to think of uh, the whole area. Uh, it will have its over G Newton. It will have its extremal value. And then fluctuations or deviations away from the extremal value. Um, so now uh, the action, uh, we're going to write an action which is, uh, which will contain another term. Uh, so somehow this action was too simple, was uh, topological. And so we'll uh, write an action which contains uh, that term. So it contains that, uh, that term. And in addition, it contains uh, the following term. Um, OK. So we'll. Keep in mind that uh, phi will be changing. So this phi will be changing, but it will be always much smaller than phi naught. 
and we'll put some cutoff here uh, where we put the boundary, and it will have some value of our boundary here that we will keep fixed. So this is where we will join this ADS2 geometry to the four-dimensional geometry, for example, or to the higher-dimensional geometry. But we'll put this cutoff in the region where the metric is kind of close to ADS2, and phi b is uh, relatively large but smaller than uh, the extremal value. Okay. Um, so that's uh, what we uh, will consider. And uh, so the action is the action, let me call this uh, S topological. Uh, and so we have the topological term in the action plus this. So this, is, this will be the full action of our system. Um, now we have one more field, one more. Uh, we have the two-dimensional metric and phi. Uh, this is a system with no propagating degrees of freedom, so there is no graviton. Uh, we expect that because this is the spherically symmetric reduction of this four-dimensional situation, and we know that there are no spherically symmetric gravity waves, so we don't expect any gravitons. Um, and in fact, if you calculate the equations of motion of this action, you find that the equation of motion for phi uh, gives, um, gives uh, that r is equal to minus 2, so the metric is completely rigid, and so the metric is ADS2, exactly ADS2 metric. And then the equations of motion for the metric imply that uh, some equation for, uh, for phi, which roughly looks like this, plus some other terms with derivative, uh, equal to zero. And so it gives three equations for phi, which determine phi up to a few constants. Okay? Um, and so uh, phi is almost completely determined. Um, and okay. Now, in order to, to understand a little better the dynamics, since phi is completely determined up to a few constants, uh, the, the only dynamics of the system is in these, two const in these few constants, the only uh, on-shell solutions. So what, what will uh, those be? So it's convenient to analyze that, to uh, analyze this theory as follows. So first you calculate, the, first you uh, imagine this as a path integral, and you integrate over phi, and then the path integral over phi sets the metric uh, to this value. And then all you are left uh, sets the metric to exactly ADS2. And then all you are left is with this boundary term. Um, and this, uh, this boundary term will take it to be very far away. So uh, we'll take phi b to be very large, so that it's uh, very far away. And then uh, we can evaluate this extrinsic curvature for one of these uh, generic curves that can be parameterized in terms of this angle. And when we evaluate that, we get uh, that the, um, we, we, we get that, um, that this term, phi b, so we, we will have to, phi b is becoming, will be becoming large. And, um, well, maybe I'll just uh, say that if we take the proper length times the scalar curvature, so that's uh, what is inside this integral. Um, when we go to, uh, in those coordinates, a C of order epsilon, that's the UV, cut, UV cutoff, we get that this goes like one over um, epsilon times du, where we're defining the proper length, uh, we are rescaling it so that uh, we rescale it by a factor of epsilon, so that u is the rescale variable. Um, and then one plus epsilon uh, squared times the Schwarzian of uh, T of U, U, okay? So T of U is uh, the time coordinate, I mean, this kind of Poincare time coordinate, um, so in, the, in the coordinates that we written before, minus dc squared plus dc squared over c squared. Um, so that's the form of the extrinsic curvature. And so if we take phi b to have of the form some constant that we will call phi renormalized times epsilon, and we uh, put it in this term in the action, there will be a term that goes like 1 over epsilon squared times du, which is uh, just proportional to the proper length. Um, so this can be viewed as a contribution to the ground state energy. And then uh, there will be a term uh, that uh, involves this phi r and du um, t of u u, um, which uh, has the form of the Schwarzian action for t of u. And here, this is epsilon independent, so we get the finite term, finite value for the action if we uh, rescale the boundary value of phi in this particular way. Um, 
And this is a natural uh, rescaling because uh, the solutions of these equations imply that phi near the boundary behaves like something like some constant divided by C, okay? So if we, as we take uh, the boundary further and further, we rescale phi B in this way, then uh, in this uh, interior region, the, the phi is constant, okay? So we'll get a constant phi here, and as we move the boundary uh, further and further, we uh, get a finite action here. Um, okay, so what uh, this has shown is that we, uh, by taking uh, the next correction from the Einstein action, so this, the, I should have emphasized that this action uh, comes from the four-dimensional four Einstein action. So take, you take the four-dimensional Einstein action, you expand it a little more in the, in the fluctuations uh, of the area around the extremal value, you get this action, okay? And so this follows from kaluza klein reduction of the four-dimensional theory, um, taking into account the next correction, and it gave us uh, an action which also had this Ratzian form. Um, and, okay, so we see that we get the same type of action we got uh, for the, in the SYK model, and uh, it is perhaps not surprising because the, the two problems had exactly the same symmetry when we started, the same uh, symmetry to lead in order, and then it's broken, and it's broken slightly, and uh, this is what uh, gives the explicit breaking. Okay. Are there any questions? Or am, am I getting you confused, or you're following this very well? Or Okay, so the, the, the point I'm making, I'm trying, the, the whole point in what I'm trying to discuss here is to try to draw the parallels. I'm discussing this two-dimensional gravity, trying to emphasize the parallels there are between uh, this problem and the problem we discussed in the previous lecture of the low energy dynamics of this uh, XY, SYK model. Trying to emphasize that in both cases we have the same symmetry. I tried to explain what the symmetry was in this case. Um, and that uh, there are effects that break this symmetry. Um, the effects in this case correspond to including the higher order corrections uh, that come from the four-dimensional four dimensional theory. And these effects lead to an effective action for that uh, reparametrization mode uh, that have exactly the same form. Okay. Is that uh, clear? Yeah, so, well, the, 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 the form of the scalar field in the interior is determined by the solution of this equation. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't discussed the constants. So the constants have to do with the constants that appear when you solve the equations of motion of this action. So there will be four integration constants, and those uh, will be constants that will be related to the to phi. Um, um, so... They, they, they really are something very simple. So uh, the, the solutions of this action uh, in these uh, coordinates <coughs> say essentially that phi is, uh, is a circle, but the circle uh, could be moved in the, uh, so you, you could move it relative to the ADS. I mean, you, you, you write the, uh, you write your radius to space, and then you have a cutout circle. So the only physical region of the geometry is the interior. This region here near the boundary will be replaced by that flat space region and so on. So we have the circle, but we can move the circle within this ADS2 space, right? So those will be like two constants. And those uh, we view as uh, equivalent configurations because the geometry inside the circle will be the same in all these cases. Um, so those we think of as uh, gauge equivalent. So they are, we are, we have um, the, the, the geometry in this interior, this cutout, you, you should imagine uh, it's like uh, cutting out a piece of, a, of, idea of hyperbolic space and we, we, we throw away the outside and then what you have inside is the same of where you place the center of that cutout. So that's uh, part of, um, that is a gauge symmetry, and that's related to the fact that this action, as we said before, had an SL2 gauge symmetry. So we should quotient out by this uh, overall SL2 symmetry. Then there is another one, which is another integration constant, which has to do with the size of this circle. So we can make it a bit bigger, a bit smaller. 
And um, that's a physical uh, degree of freedom. It's the only physical degree of freedom in the solution. And it, um, what it physically is saying is uh, it's telling us what the energy of this black hole above extremality is, or what the temperature above extremality is. Okay. So that's what it corresponds to. Um, OK, so may maybe just to make the, the discussion a little abstract, I should uh, mention that the change of coordinates that goes between this time and that time is that tangent that we uh, mentioned yesterday. I hope this doesn't. Uh, um, and then when you write the uh, Schwarzian action in terms of the other uh, variable, there is here a t. You can write it as tu plus a term that goes like t prime squared. And this contains the second derivatives, the third derivatives of u. So you, if you take a, ta a, a time here, which is uh, tau, so the, the solution, physical solution, is uh, something where we have u over beta here, um, maybe a factor of 2 pi. So that, um, so a linear solution here, for sure, will be a solution of, of this part, because this involves higher, higher derivatives, or squares, or second order derivatives, and so on. So, um, and uh, of course, uh, it also obeys uh, the equations of motion coming from here. So that will be a solution of the equations. And this uh, corresponds to, because uh, rho is proportional to the derivative of tau. So as we change beta, we get this uh, to be bigger or smaller. So this, I just said mathematically what I had said before uh, in the picture. Um, OK, so that's, uh, those are the solutions. Um, um, is there any question? There is a fourth integration constant, which is just to add a constant to u, which is just rotating the circle. That also leaves the same answer. Um, other questions? Am I saying things that uh, I, you you look lost? You all look look lost or bored? I don't know. Yeah. I, okay. New. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm trying to set up what, what, what is behind uh, this is that we want to argue that nearly ADS2 is the same as uh, nearly CFT1, OK? There isn't, there isn't, that doesn't, doesn't make sense to talk about the CFT1, which is what we started with, with scale invariant quantum mechanical theory. Uh, but uh, it does make sense to talk about this nearly uh, conformal and nearly ADS2 situation. Um, Um, okay, so um, now as I said, this is the expected action for any near extremal black hole solution, including the rotating black hole solutions. Uh, that hasn't been demonstrated explicitly, but it's uh, probably true. Um, um, okay. Um, right now. I'm going to now to uh, give uh, another uh, way to think about the dynamics of this uh, 2D gravity, um, uh, mainly thinking about the Lorentzian situation, and uh, where you will see the, in the simplicity of uh, gravitational dynamics in this, in this, uh, in this situation. Um, Um, so Lorentzian ADS2 uh, has the form of a strip, okay? This is the Penrose diagram of Lorentzian ADS2. Uh, there are various forms for the metrics, so the one that makes uh, the strip manifest is uh, this one. The, so sigma goes from 0 to pi, and then we have a sine square of sigma. Um, now, if we took this uh, near extremal black hole or that uh, situation and we continue to Lorentzian signature, we will get the metric in the so-called Rindler coordinates. Um, so where the, let's say, right, right Rindler patch, for example, has a metric uh, which is uh, minus the tau square plus, uh, let's say, for example, sine hyperbolic square of d tau square times sine hyperbolic square of rho plus d rho square. So rho goes from, uh, from zero here at the horizon to infinity. And uh, the surfaces of constant 
constant roll look like this, and as time progresses, we follow the trajectory, okay? So we said that those, uh, those curves were at, so this tau here is the Lorentzian version of the tau that is in the blackboard over there. Um, so uh, this region near the boundary would be uh, a curve here uh, that sits uh, in this region. So when we go from that Euclidean black hole to the Lorentzian black hole, uh, we get uh, a Lorentzian black hole which uh, has two sides. So it has the right black hole and the left black hole uh, joined by the wormhole that we uh, talked about yesterday. And, um, um, okay. Um, so it's important that the physical, if we have a quantum mechanical dual of this theory, or we are looking at this from the four dimensional point of view, the time of the asymptotic time in four dimensions or the time of the quantum mechanical dual is this proper time U that we were talking about here. So when we join this to a four dimensional space, we are joining this near the, uh, let's say the top of the neck of this geometry that we were talking about. And the time coordinate here and the time coordinate over there, they're related perhaps by a constant uh, redshift factor, uh, but that, that's just a constant factor because we're putting, placing this cutoff at a distance from the top that is fixed, okay? So when we are changing these geometries and changing these cutout geometries, we are changing the interior, but we are not changing the distance between the, this cutoff surface and uh, the bulk space, okay? So this U, you should think of it as the physical time. So when we think of the black hole as a quantum mechanical system, U is the physical time. Um, okay, at that point I hadn't said before, but are there questions? Uh, this term? This one? Yeah. Uh, no, well, no, it's the same as this action. So these two actions are equal. It's just that uh, this variable t is equal to tangent uh, of uh, tau, okay? So it's just this change of variable. Uh, we just use this change of variables between t and tau. And so the same, uh, the same Schwarzian is written. You should think of this as conceptually equivalent. Uh, it's just in different coordinates. Yeah, one of the exercises asks, asks you to, to check this. Um, okay, now one important point about this uh, Schwarzian action is that it's local in time, okay? So, um, so you can think of uh, the dynamic, so this boundary uh, is a dynamical uh, object and but it has an action which is uh, and it has an action which is local in time, okay? So you can think of the boundary as a particle that moves in ADS2 space uh, with an action uh, with just a, which has the local action. And uh, the solutions of this motion are uh, these curves that we drew here. So those are the solutions of the motion. Um, very good. Um, so we can think of uh, the whole problem as, um, as two independent particles uh, that are moving in, in ADS2 going to the boundary. So if you, you, you might say, well, but what kind of particle? I mean, this, this looks like a weird, very weird action for a system that has uh, second order derivatives and so on, and has higher, higher derivatives. It turns out that the, um, this action, you can uh, rewrite it as uh, the action of a particle moving in ADS2 space, or a massive particle moving in ADS2 space in the presence of some constant, uh, let's say, electric field, okay? So it's like a particle in ADS2 with constant uh, electric charge. This electric charge has nothing to do with the electric charge of the black hole. This is just a mathematical equivalent. Um, and uh, so just to emphasize that it's not something very exotic, the dynamics of this particle. Um, so we have the dynamics of the two particles, and if we had matter in the interior, we would also have matter. And so we can add matter to this action. And if we write a matter action which contains some matter fields and the metric, but not the dilaton, not this field, then the dynamics is uh, very simple because the equation of motion for the dilaton is, not, is unchanged, so we still have this, uh, this, this condition. The only condition, the only equation that will be changed is this one that will have the T mu nu of matter. 
Uh, but the equations, the matter moves in a rigid ADS2 space, so matter moves in, a, in this rigid ADS2 space, has um, no knowledge of the position of the boundaries. Um, and the only, um, the only constraint uh, that uh, will link uh, these uh, three particles is the fact that uh, they, um, the, the physical wave functions or the physical situations should be invariant and their uh, overall translations of this whole thing, overall isometry, overall ADS2 isometries of this whole setup, okay? So somehow what is relevant is the distance between, for example, this matter particle and the boundary uh, this the physical boundary, and not be, so the the distance between the the pos relative position of the matter to the to this mathematical boundary that's not relevant. So what's relevant is the distance between this and the physical boundary. So it's a bit like this uh, Mach principle, where you uh, have to say that what's important is the distance between you know the yourself and the distant stars, right? The distant stars are like this boundary here. Um, and that mathematically can be understood as saying that, well, this is a particle moving in ADS2. Uh, since ADS2 has SL2 isometries, it will, this matter particle will have some SL2 charges, let's say Q right, three charges, uh, conserved charges, and then the matter also will have three conserved charges. And then the left particle will also have three conserved charges, and all these are equal to zero. That's the condition that they should be invariant under overall translations or SL2 symmetry. Yes? Yeah, it was too quick, so let me just uh, say it uh, a little more slowly. So I, I will derive now that relationship, okay? So we said that once we impose, once we integrate out this phi, uh, we get an action which uh, is phi b times the extrinsic curvature, okay? So we have the action of a, of a system in ADS2 that uh, is moving, uh, well, has some trajectory, um, and has some action uh, which is the given by the extrinsic curvature. This looks like an unfamiliar system. Um, we, we also discussed that, uh, that there there in principle we could have a term, we will need a term to cancel this, uh, which is proportional to the length of the trajectory. So there is a piece here that goes like the length, right? Integral du, where u is proper time. Let me put the coefficient that we need, let me call it m, okay? Um, so we'll need some term like this that will cancel uh, this diversion term. So we have an action basically of, uh, that consists of these two terms. So m times the proper length, that's like the action of a massive particle, and then this term. So this term can be rewritten again using uh, Euler's uh, formula as uh, chi, the Euler character, uh, minus or plus uh, the integral of uh, square root of gr, okay? Um, and then um, this is just a constant, so phi b times this is just a constant, which doesn't matter. And uh, r is also constant, so this is equal to the area, okay? Now, if we had a particle in a constant electric field, um, then the electric field would also be proportional to the volume element, okay, the field strength. Um, and the integral of the field strength would also be, uh, so this can be rewritten as the integral of uh, two-dimensional field strength that is constant proportional to the volume, and that's equal to the integral along the boundary of the gauge potential F, okay? Um, this is just some fictitious, uh, gauge field that we introduced just to make contact with a uh, normal electrically charged particle, okay? And so this term can be then rewritten as m integral du plus integral of a with some q, some uh, coefficient q that uh, has to do with this phi b, okay? So in the end, we have a particle with mass m and charge q. And these coefficients are going to infinity in some ratio, so they're both very large, and but their difference is very small, okay? So it's a situation where we have uh, a particle with a mass that is very close to the extreme, some kind of extremal mass here where, um, yeah, M maybe I should uh, say a few more things. So if you have, if you have an electric field in, uh, in ADS2, then uh, depending on the mass to charge ratio, uh, you might be able to pair create particles. Um, 
And in this situation, the mass is slightly less than the charge, so we are somehow able to fair create these particles. And um, this, uh, if you were to pair create, the result would be these two particles that yeah, so the, the mass is slightly less than the charge, okay? And in this regime, okay, let me, let me just not talk about pair curve. Let me just talk about the possible boundary trajectories. So if the mass is slightly bigger than the charge, there will be, the trajectory looks like this. If the mass is equal to the charge, then the trajectory looks like that. And if the mass is less than the charge, uh, then the trajectories uh, basically look like this, like ordinary massive parts. So the case, um, sorry, I have this inequality the other way around. So the case of Q equal to zero, that's uh, the usual motion of a particle in an ADS2 space. I mean, this is the motion because there is a gravitational potential here uh, that is uh, becoming very large near the boundaries. And so the particle sort of oscillates in this gravitational potential. Um, so, okay, so I'm, I'm just giving you the, the usual intuition of the motion of particles and why uh, in this situation that we arises in this problem, it looks like the motion, uh, this is the kind of motion that we have. Is that clear? And uh, we, by taking them to be very large or very close to, so that it's smaller than the charge, but very, very close to the charge, this particle is very close to the boundary, okay? Um. Is it? Yes. Yes. Um. I mean, this is an integral over one dimension, right? Uh, so ds, the proper distance. Um, so we have a two-dimensional space, and then uh, this extrinsic curvature is the, so extrinsic curvature is defined, uh, well, in this, for this case, uh, it's the uh, co-dimension one surface. So it has one orthogonal dimension. So we started with two dimensions, and this is the line. So we have a line, and it's the extrinsic curvature. So it's the curvature of this line, so for example, in, um, if, let's say we are in flat space, uh, this would have extrinsic curvature zero, right? If we now put a curved surface like this in flat space, it would have no zero extrinsic curvature. Is, is that what you're asking, or maybe you're asking something different? Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, um, of course, in, if you are in four dimensions, the, uh, this comes from a four-dimensional uh, four, four dimensional term, and this would come from a term in three dimensions. After we integrate over the surface, the two sphere, uh, we get this, and this would be the area of that two sphere. That's, uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this kind of picture gives now a very simple description of the dynamics in this space. Um, and uh, we'll uh, give some examples of uh, how the dynamics look like now. So, so in, they like the field pushing towards the wall. Yeah. No, no, no. It's it's it's, con it's uh, you should think of it constant, and this has positive charge, and this has negative charge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, but but it's, uh, this is just equivalent to this purely gravity comes purely from gravity. So don't, don't think of this as a physical. Thing. This is just to guide your intuition. Um, now. Now, we, we said before when we talked about chaos that um, the motion motion of the Schwarzian theory is similar to motion in hyperbolic space or motion in ADS2 space. Now, now we've uh, made this more concrete. We, we had the same action with the extrinsic curvature, and we related it to motion of a particle in ADS2 space, right? That's what we just did. And we also mentioned that uh, if we calculate the extrinsic curvature, we get the Schwarzian, right? That relates the two, two things. There are two equivalent uh, actions. Okay, so imagine we have a black hole. Um, so uh, we have some initial uh, configuration like this. Uh, and now uh, we, it's empty, so we have the equilibrium black hole, and we send in some matter, okay? Now when we send in some matter, we would expect the <coughs> black hole to grow, okay? The horizon to move a little bit outwards, and um, some the, the, if, if you had something here very close to the original horizon, if we throw matter, that object will not be able to make it out to infinity, okay? Because the horizon has grown. So that's what we expect uh, in general. Um, 
So that's the gravitational back reaction. How does that look in this case? So here we'll send this, this matter. As we said, the matter in the bulk does not interact. So there is no, well, but we might, uh, well, we could consider free matter in the bulk, so it doesn't interact in the bulk. So the gravitational back reaction here comes from the fact that when we send this, this matter, these uh, charges that we had here had to be conserved. And when you sit at this point, some of these charges look like momentum, uh, energy and momentum in this two dimensional picture. And so if you send some uh, momentum in this direction, this uh, boundary particle gets a momentum kick in the other direction, right? So you should, uh, you will, just by the conservation of these charges, you know that the dynamics should be of this form. And uh, the new trajectory of the particle, therefore, will uh, be this one, right? So it's kicked a bit outward, so we will reach the boundary of ADS before uh, the other particle, okay? And so now, uh, the new horizon of the black hole uh, will be here. So the horizon of the black hole is determined by um, the, the point where this uh, reaches the boundary. So this is, um, there is an infinite proper time until you reach the boundary here, okay? Um, so here you see the, the simplicity of the picture of 2D graph, of the dynamics of gravity. And um, it's uh, just contained, uh, dynamics of gravity, just the dynamics of, uh, of these boundary particles, um, and so on. Uh, and we'll see perhaps uh, one uh, more example later. But before we go to one more example, I would like to uh, emphasize once more the parallels between SYK and, uh, and this situation. So we had SYK at uh, low energies. And uh, we had nearly ADS2 gravity, which is what we are discussing now. Right. So uh, in SYK, we talked about the classical solution G, that one like one over T to the two delta, right? That had some, and that's somehow analogous or somewhat vaguely similar to the ADS2 metric, okay? It had this invariant under SL2 symmetries and not invariant under general reparametrizations. So we had reparametrization. The equations had reparametrization symmetry. And this is the same in both sides, so that's equal. There is also a symmetry, as, well, here we called it asymptotic symmetry. This is the conventional name for this type of symmetries. Um, I should emphasize that there have been many recent papers uh, uh, talking about the asymptotic symmetries of four-dimensional flat space. That's the same concept, so that's the four-dimensional analog of this type of symmetries. Uh, within this, we had uh, an SL2 that left this invariant, uh, the same uh, here. So there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So this solution spontaneously uh, breaks uh, two uh, diffeomorphisms over SL2, right? Um, and in addition, this is explicitly broken by Schwarzian action, uh, FD. F U, D U, um, and so on. And the coefficient of the Schwarzian action in one case uh, had to do with n over j. Uh, if you did extremal black holes, uh, for example, for an extremal Reissman-Ostrom black hole, it's given by the extremal radius of the black hole over g Newton uh, cube. Okay. So now these are all the similarities, and now there are also differences. So um, I will point out the differences. So in uh, nearly ADS2 gravity, um, I run out of blackboard here to point out the differences. Um, so this continues here. So here we have SYK. So here we had uh, something we were calling G in the orthogonal directions. Remember there was a valley uh, parameterized by F, and then there were orthogonal directions. And this describes other physical excitations of the SYK model. And here we can have matter in the interior. So extra matter fields uh, described by the local quantum field theory in the interior. Um, this will vary from, uh, there could be various versions of SYK. These are different for the various SYKs uh, with different cues, for example. 
Uh, here it depends on which particular Kaluza Klein reaction we did, uh, whether we came from four dimensions, whether it came from a 10 dimensional string theory, whether it came from whatever. Um, this will be different. And not only that, but these ones are, uh, are different in a deeper way in the sense that um, this is described by a local quantum field theory, while uh, this is probably not described by a local quantum field theory. At least no one has found a description in terms of a local quantum field theory. And there are some reasons for thinking it would not exist. Um, okay, so is that clear? Okay, so um, now there are more things you can do with this uh, that are, are interesting. And one of them is to quantize this theory exactly. Well, I think I mentioned that before. So you can quantize exactly and do now quantum gravity and so on. Um, OK, so I think I'll, I'll discuss now one uh, extra thing, which is um, um, a connection between, uh, how much I have to, 10 minutes? Um, so here, uh, this full diagram should be interpreted in the uh, boundary theory as in terms of the th so-called thermophile double state. So if we had a dual quantum mechanical theory, um, the, we can define this thermophile double state where we have beta En over 2 En En for the left and the right systems. This is the left and this is the right. One is time reversed, uh, that's a small detail. Um, and that's supposed to be related to that full geometry. To be a little more precise, this state uh, gives, uh, this, this well, corresponds to time equal to zero, and the full geometry corresponds to evolving uh, that state with respect to both the left and right uh, boundary times. So there is, a, there is a U left, U right, and U left, which are the the boundary times of uh, the, the times of these two decoupled systems. So we have two decoupled systems. Yeah, maybe I should emphasize this. We start. Uh, so this full this full diagram is related to two decoupled quantum mechanical systems. One governed by a Hamiltonian H left, and the other one governed by a Hamiltonian H right, which are identical. And then uh, at time equal to zero, we have this. Uh, when both times are equal to zero, we have this uh, thermophile double state. Um, so let's say time equal to zero is here. So you can think of that as describing the system on this spatial slice. Um, in general relativity, the spatial slice is the same, uh, is equivalent to uh, any other uh, slice within this uh, so-called willard de Witt patch, um, because different slices are related by uh, the willard de Witt equation, or just the Hamiltonian constraint of general relativity. So if you know everything about this slice, then you can uh, figure out what happens on the other slice. So that somehow the state at equal to zero is described, uh, is described in this region of the geometry. You can evolve the right system or the left system uh, in time, and then you get other regions of this geometry in principle. Okay. This is what the expected relationship is supposed to be. Um, okay, forget with the width equation. That's uh, for the name. So there is, uh, in general relativity, the equations of motion right, uh, relate uh, what happens on this uh, on this slice to what happens in the next slice. Okay. So as long as I don't move the boundary points, so it, uh, yeah. The equations of GR are causal, right? And um, if you give the initial value problem here, uh, you can evolve uh, to the future within this region. If you want to evolve to this point, you also will need to uh, know what, what you were doing here on the boundary. You will need to know whether you sent some particles or not and so on. The evolution up to this point is not uniquely defined. The evolution from this surface to the, all these other surfaces is uniquely defined. Is that more clear? Yeah. Um, OK. Um, now, and notice that uh, these are two decoupled systems. And so uh, if I wanted if we wanted to, um, something that should not be possible is to 
uh, send the signal from one side to the other, right? And indeed, if we wanted to send the signal from uh, the, let's say, right side to the left side, so we send the signal, and this signal comes here, but that's not a region that is accessible to the left observer, right? So the left observer cannot get uh, to that signal. But it looks a little funny that there is this region of the geometry, right? And the, the left observer cannot access it, right? Is there some, and it's almost very close to the region that the left observer can access, right? So we have, if this signal, we send, if we send this signal very early, this could be very close to the horizon, and so the left observer can suddenly see something coming, something that is on this side of the horizon. So is there anything that uh, we can do so that uh, this signal becomes visible? Okay. Um, by the general principles of uh, quantum mechanics, it should not be possible uh, to see this signal uh, if we just if we don't put any interaction between the two sides, right? So in order to see that signal, we'll have to put some interaction between the two sides. Okay. So imagine that, um, so Gabby Jefferies and Wall said, uh, let's uh, put, for example, a small interaction for some time near time equal to zero. So when the both times are equal to zero. So let's imagine now we have, we start with this thermal field double state, and then uh, we, when we evolve uh, the system, so before we were evolving the system by simply putting H left, uh, U left, plus uh, H right, U right. So this is the decoupled uh, evolution, right? Um, but now uh, let's imagine we, this is part of a full system, and in the full system we evolve by, let's say, the same time, and we insert uh, in this unitary evolution, not just this free evolution, but at some point uh, we'll also insert some interaction, e to the i, um, let's say it only occurs at the, at the given time, so O left of zero and O right of zero. Two operators of the theory that are dual to uh, bulk fields in the interior. So the, the theory has some bulk fields, um, let me call them chi, these are matter fields, and the the operator O is the operator in the dual quantum mechanical theory that is dual to the matter field chi. So in, the, in this bulk picture, what we have is an interaction between the, the, the values of, um, of the field chi um, at the left and right boundaries. So the, the field chi is a, a two-dimensional field. Here, chi left is the value of the field on the left boundary, and chi right is the value of the field in the right boundary. So in the bulk, we could also insert this uh, term in the evolution here of the bulk theory, and we can ask uh, what this gives. An important point is that in this background, um, chi left and chi right are correlated because um, of the finite, because they are in some sense close to each other, and when you have uh, two points in space that are uh, close to each other through what well, separated by a finite distance, there will be a non-trivial correlation. Uh, similarly, you can say that they are correlated because, because the, the quantum states of a field are entangled across uh, the, on the two sides of the Rinder wedges. Um, so one way we can uh, understand the effects of this is that uh, this operator that we are putting, so to, to lean on in perturbation theory, we can think about the expectation value of this operator. And so the expectation value will give a little potential uh, between these two boundary particles, some extra potential. And if we adjust the coefficient here in front, so let me, let's put the coefficient g, and if we assign the sign of g properly, we can uh, make this potential attractive. So we can make the potential between these two particles attractive. And if we do that, then uh, we have a kick to the boundary trajectory, which is, which is inwards, right? And now the new boundary trajectories will follow, um, will follow these trajectories. And then the particle that um, was uh, initially not visible now becomes visible from the left side, okay? Um, okay, now uh, this, this whole setup is uh, somewhat similar to quantum teleportation. So the idea that uh, it, this is not exactly quantum teleportation, we can make it equal to quantum teleportation by, well, I, I won't discuss the details. Um, 
let me just say that by putting here some interaction that involves uh, another field, uh, this could be a different field than the one that we sent uh, here. So this could be, I don't know, some chi tilde field. Um, we nevertheless managed to um, send the signal from the from the right to the left side. So here, the interesting point is not so much that you can send the signal, because we are just putting a coupling between the two sides. Of course, now we can send signal. But how the signal is sent. So the signal is going really through this wormhole from the left to the right side. And by thinking a little further about this, you can uh, you can shed some light on some um, some apparent uh, funny features of black holes and entanglements and so on that I, I won't I won't discuss. Okay, thank you. these two particles at this process, right? Yeah. So you just insert this interaction at one specific point in time. Or what do you, like? Sorry. Yeah, this interaction in this case is set at one point in time. Yeah, what, Th there can are, you go you for a longer time step or just? Well, th there are various possibilities. So here I discussed only this example. Yeah. Um, you could, for example, an, another variation on this theme is to keep this interaction for a long time. and. Uh, the, exactly what happens depends on the strength of the interaction. Mm -hmm. And if you tune also the strength, you, you could have a situation where the, the two particles actually move. Um, so these are the boundaries of ADS, and then the, the two particles could end up moving along straight lines, for example. This is with a special tune coefficient for G. Um, and then in this situation, you have something that you could call an eternally traversable wormhole, where you can always send signal between the, signals between the two sides. Right? But there are, uh, of course, uh, these couplings that are relating. And you can use this uh, idea to then also build four-dimensional, uh, so complete four-dimensional solutions, which uh, have a, a shape roughly like, uh, so they look like near ex two near extremal black holes. But then uh, the geometry inside is similar to this one, so that they are connected. These two wormholes are connected. And there is then no, no horizon. and. Uh, you have a final solution that looks like this. And you can embed, you can even embed the solution in the standard model. So. Okay. Uh, recently, Papadodimas, Jan de Boer proposed that uh, another people that you can use mirror operators mm -hmm. uh, in order to do some similar protocol like this mm -hmm. gauge of as well. And there it seems that they are only using one CFT and yeah. not two. Yeah. So do you? Um, yeah. So um, um, right. So he, here we had uh, the second side was. Uh, so when we have this situation, the fields on here, the right side, are entangled with the fields on the left side, right? Um, and, and both have somehow an independent existence and definition. And uh, this is a special state where they're entangled in this form. Mm -hmm. Now, you could have a situation where you have, let's say, a pure state of the right side. And um, then, um, yeah. So the, the story about mirror operators is the idea that you think that you have, a, let's say, a pure state on the right side. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there will be some simple operators you can measure on the right side that will, will, will look similar to, what, to the results you would get by doing simple operations here on the right uh, render wedge. Um, and then uh, you define some state-dependent operators that are entangled with uh, these operators mm -hmm. in the same way that uh, they're entangled. That the left and right operators are entangled here. So this is the so-called mirror operator construction. Um, so there, by definition, you uh, have a state that looks like a thermofield double. And then if you start from that state, then you can imagine acting with, let's say, the mirror operators and do this. Everything that you can do here, you could uh, do in that, that situation. Uh, uh, yeah, but it seems that it's only needed to use the entanglement pattern at uh, just one CFT. And yeah, yeah you use, in that case, you use one. So so conceptually, it's different from the gauge. Conceptually, it's different from the gauge. It is different. Yeah, it's different from what I'm saying here, oh, because here, here the 
two sides are defined independently. Mm -hmm. So they, they are, both are some uh, quantum system that uh, is independently defined. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I've said here is valid for the, the particular entangled state that we discussed over there. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, so here, for example, you could, um, uh, this, this story that I said here for ADS2 is similar for, let's say, SYK, right? So you have a rather similar story. And so you could, in principle, build an SYK in your lab and find all these relationships that you send a signal from one, and then you act this operator, you get the signal on the other, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's something you could uh, do in the lab. Um, if uh, you had just a single SYK and you try to do the mirror operator construction, um, well, you would have to know which state you started from, and then you would have, you could also do the mirror construction. Uh, but it will depend on the state that you started from. You have to know what the state is. Without knowing what the state is, you couldn't do anything. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Yeah. Are there any war Takahashi identities uh, investigated in this uh, ADS to CFT1 corresponding? I don't know. Are there any? War Takahashi identities? I didn't get the, could you repeat what you said? The War Takahashi identities, which are like, um, whenever you have an ident identity in a correlator and you renormalize the theory and then the identities uh, uh, hold. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're the, yeah th those, those are some identities that ensure that the computations you're doing are gauge invariant in a gauge theory, um, or that they have some global symmetry that you, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, th this is a technique that you could apply to this, but it's not, uh, yeah, it's not, I don't know. You, you could apply if you are doing perturbation theory around these solutions. But sort of an orthogonal thing to, to this one. Sorry, uh, one question. Uh, in the diagram in the middle with the diamond, uh, you said that, imagine we know the complete information of the state, yes. which is in that. We know that this the information should be the same as yes. moving upwards yes, or downwards. Yes. So does that mean that, it, it, take another one, which yeah. is inside the black hole. That, yeah. Does that mean that if you know the state, we actually have information of the interior. Yeah, of the yeah. I mean, okay. this is tr what I, the statement I made is about gravity, and it's true in gravity that if we know the initial conditions here, we can go here. Um, so so I, I, I should emphasize that we don't know the translation between, let's say, different slices here, no, of course, and something in the quantum mechanics, right? I mean, that would be nice to say I start from the variables in quantum mechanics, and then I have a nice picture for what the different slices here mean. Uh, that we thanks. Don't have. Yeah. Sorry. Um, what happens if you include supersymmetry in the gravity sector? You need to include bosons in the SYK or something like that? You, you, you're asking whether, what happens if I include supersymmetry? In the, in the gravity part. Uh, basically, everything is the same. You can write a Schwarzian in yeah, the action. Yeah, yeah, instead of a Schwarzian, there is a, some kind of super Schwarzian, so uh, they are not simply these boundary reparametrizations, but you can, there, there is also a fermionic variable, fermionic part, partner of this F, and you also have to give it as a function of time, and so, yeah. And these boundary particles we're talking here are also super particles with some extra degrees of freedom, but it's conceptually the same. There is nothing, nothing new. More questions? I mean, some, some details are interesting. I mean, well, maybe I should just say that it's, everything that I discuss here is the same. Uh, some details of the density of state and so on are slightly different. Yeah. Okay, so we have a... Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. How they be reproduced? Yeah, how, how are they reproduced? Very good, very good. Yeah, so we, we discussed uh, the computations uh, of the four-point function of the enhanced terms that were uh, computed using the Schwarzian theory, right? Where we integrate over F. 
yeah, so those computations, let me discuss them in the Euclidean uh, situation. So those computations are done as follows. So we have, let's say, four points. Uh, and then um, we have two kinds of particles that propagate between these four points. We have bulk uh, fields. Uh, let me denote them like this. So these are, let's say, point one and two and three and four. And then we have the boundary particles, right? So the full uh, path integral is given by integrating over the position of these boundary particles. It's, it's given by computing this Feynman diagram. This is just an ADS propagator of a free particle, the, the, the white line. And this is also an ADS propagate, essentially a propagator of a free particle, but uh, in a, an electric field. So, so it's given by the product of all these propagators and integrating over this boundary point. That's the full, um, that's the full answer. We, we also discussed the perturbative answer, right? So per perturbative answer is to uh, approximate this as a classical trajectory and some small deviation around the classical trajectory. And that leads to a simplified diagram. Like that. Yeah, in, in the, yeah, they, they are fermions, yeah, in the case. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you can, uh, yeah, you could, uh, the black hole here could evaporate, right? Um, and then you, you, you would have to couple this boundary particle to some exterior, um, and so you can have energy coming out. An important thing is that by, the, when the black hole evaporates, sort of these particles kind of slows down so that the temperature goes down, but it will never reach the boundary beyond this point, beyond the initial horizon. It will uh, reach the boundary, uh, yeah. Because otherwise it would be able to see what you sent from the left side. Uh, and that should not be possible. And indeed you check that it's not possible. You have very interesting uh, binary relation ones to do directly in exploitation of quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah, I think the most interesting one, uh, well, for me, the most interesting one is this one involving teleportation. Uh, that's an interesting quantum mechanical process. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, one version of, uh, in order for it to be teleportation, what you, what you really want is to here measure Hawking radiation, do a classical measurement here, and then send classical information to the left side and do a quantum operation here. And you can, the, the final picture is the same. Yeah, I mean, th there might be other other interesting questions you can ask. I mean, one of the points is that uh, doing quantum gravity in ADS2 is uh, quite simple. It's very simple. Uh, and yet you can have non-trivial effects and you can analyze it. And there are many more things that, that can be done and have been done. So, uh, In fact, uh, I haven't talked at all, but there are some recent papers or work in progress by Saad, Stanford, and uh, Schenker and they, they have managed to quantize this, this theory that I discussed with the phi and r, right? It's called Jacob Teitelbaum theory, without matter, and they managed to do the full quantization of that theory um, and show that it's equivalent to some matrix model and so on that allows them to compute even exponentially small effects, and which are the kinds of effects that are supposed to restore unitarity in uh, black hole questions. Okay, so if there are no more questions, okay, let's thank Juan again. So we have a 15 minute break and then we'll uh, meet for discussing the exercises of Juan. So um, in the afternoon, just before uh, Zohar's lecture, we'll have a group picture, so just here. So just come back a little bit early from, for his lecture. Thank you.